Georgia, from New York west to Iowa and beyond. Most Americans still lived on farms and small towns when the 20th century began. The new farm machinery and the tractor introduced in 1902 would revolutionize farming. For those who lived further west, on the frontier in Texas, Utah, Wyoming, and Montana, life was even more difficult. The railroads were bringing the 20th century to the isolated communities of the frontier. But many Americans lived far from the rail lines in 1900 and remained isolated from the rest of the country. In the logging camps of the Pacific Northwest, the rivers were the highways to civilization. And prospectors wandered the hills, hoping to strike it rich. The American West in 1900 was still a land of cowboys. Most Indians were living on reservations. Cattle ranching was big business. Rodeos and the traveling Wild West shows were powerful legacies of the Western frontier passed on to the 20th century. In 1900, Buffalo Bill was still traveling the country with Annie Oakley and Sitting Bull, all legends in their own lifetime. Perhaps nothing did more to bring the 20th century to the farm and frontier than the wish books, the mail order catalogs of Sears Roebuck and Montgomery Ward. In 1901, the Sears catalog cost 50 cents. Valued customers got them free. Rural families called it the Farmer's Bible and kept it in the kitchen. It was even used in schools to teach reading and arithmetic. You could buy everything from kitchen gadgets to imported palms. You could even buy a house by mail. By 1907, Sears was printing three million catalogs a year, selling everything you needed from birth to death. All merchandise was guaranteed. All sales were cash. The introduction of rural free delivery in 1896 gave a tremendous boost to the mail order business. It meant that every farmer's doorstep was now a highway to the world. And new machinery was speeding delivery of letters as well. Every year, mailmen delivered billions of magazines and newspapers to homes across the country. The 20th century meant change, especially in the cities. New York was the fastest growing city. It was also the center of America's high society. The richest families, like the Vanderbilts, all had homes there. New York society was called the 400. Mrs. Astor's ballroom only held 400. Everything they did was news. Many spent summers in Newport and winters in Palm Beach with servants to take care of every need. For those not quite as rich, who couldn't afford to own a winter home in Florida, there were new luxury hotels that Henry Flagler built along his new rail line from St. Augustine to Key West, providing comfort for the well-to-do. The wealth of some was fabulous, like Mrs. John McLean. Her husband owned newspapers. She owned the Hope Diamond and led a life of luxury and leisure. For black Americans, life was different. They were excluded from the economic mainstream. In 1896, the Supreme Court had approved the doctrine of separate but equal. Now, Jim Crow laws were being passed to segregate blacks from whites and maintain the social order. Jim Crow laws, like racial stereotypes, would take generations to reverse. In 1900, Booker T. Washington was the most famous black man in America, and his autobiography, Up From Slavery, was a bestseller. Like botanist George Washington Carver, he believed blacks could gain self-respect through education and in turn earn the respect of whites. Booker T. Washington was the most famous graduate of Hampton Institute, a vocational school established for blacks after the Civil War.
when Tuskegee Institute was established in Alabama as the Hampton of the Deep South, Booker T. Washington was chosen as its president. Like Hampton, Tuskegee was a vocational school teaching farm work, carpentry, and domestic skills. By 1900, Booker T. Washington and Tuskegee were as well known as Andrew Carnegie. For some black Americans, these were hopeful signs. Ellis Island, some called it the Island of Hope, others the Isle of Tears. For more than eight million immigrants who arrived on America's shores in the first decade of the new century, this was the promised land. Passage through Ellis Island could be a terrifying ordeal. Inspectors looking for signs of physical or mental illness that could mean deportation. And questions sometimes hard to understand. What is your name? Do you have a job? Are you an anarchist? Most who arrived were admitted. Once through immigration, many came on to Manhattan. By now, more than a third of New York's population were immigrants. On the streets of the Lower East Side, the blur of a dozen languages. Here, Jews and Catholics from Poland, Hungary, Italy, and Russia became Americans. America was a land of opportunity, but the streets were not paved with gold, as many had been led to believe. Life was not easy for these new Americans. The crowded city streets were exciting places. They could become places of disaster and nightmare. A fire in downtown Baltimore in the winter of 1902 destroyed the city's business district. The San Francisco earthquake and fire was the worst disaster of the decade. Hundreds were killed in the 1906 earthquake. But most loss of life and property was due to fires. Broken gas lines and electrical wires started fires that raged out of control for two days. Six square miles of the city were destroyed. A thousand people killed. A quarter million left homeless and without food. President Roosevelt asked Congress to appropriate two and a half million dollars for relief. Food and water were carried in by army pack mules. 